Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I apologize for this funny thing on my head. Uh, it looks funny, but it's, I think it will work. I hope you can hear me. And thank you for coming today. We have arrived at our penultimate station of our journey, uh, exploring the 32 Beethoven piano sonatas. Today we are going to talk about three masterpieces. The E minor sonata opus 90 that I just played the exposition of the first movement of. The A major opus 101 and opus 106 B flat major, the so-called Hammer Klavier. So we have arrived to the late period of Beethoven and these are the most enigmatic, the most uh, mysterious masterpieces. There is an awful lot to say about them, but it's very, very difficult to talk about this music. It's just really too great to put in words. So, I hope I won't be a total failure in that. But it's really not an easy thing to talk about. We don't want to go into very dry musical analysis here, because there are people who can do it much better. <laughs> you can get all those magnificent books, great musicologists and I would say almost scientists who have tried to, to solve these puzzles. And the puzzles are still there, especially a work like the Hammerklavier Sonata. Beethoven said that here is a work that is going to cause problems for pianists and music lovers for the next 50 years. Well, that's, that's the understatement of the century. <laughs> because here we are, this work was written in 1817, 1818, and even today we are puzzled. We, we, nobody really knows what, what this music means, what it has to say, but the thing is that, that it is so modern and it has never lost its freshness and it speaks to us with never-ending novelty. So let's start with the E minor sonata, Opus 90, which is the work that introduces Beethoven's last period. It already with one foot it is in the past, and with one foot it points to the future. You could tell that this is not pretty music. It's anything but pretty. It doesn't fit into any cliches. Um, Beethoven is not trying to please you here. He had written deliberately a work in two movements, but we have seen that before in the sonatas Opus 54. Uh, or the F-sharp major sonata Opus 78. Even after this sonata, there will be Opus 111, the last Beethoven sonata, that is incidentally also in two movements. But there, I would say that one does not notice that it's in two movements, because it seems to be infinite. So this um, structure of two movements, it goes back to a Haydnian model. Haydn wrote many piano sonatas in two movements. Uh, Mozart 
never. But incidentally, there is an E minor sonata by Mozart for violin and piano. which is also in two movements. And this is the only work by Mozart in E minor. It's very strange. It's a tonality that he had not used. Um, Beethoven certainly must have known this Mozart sonata. He also must have known Haydn's E minor piano sonata. This is one of those Haydn Sturm und Drang sonatas. So, the Opus 90 was written in 1814, and Beethoven has had a very long gap after the previous sonata, which was the Les Adieux. in the last program. So the Les Adieu Sonata, or the Das Lebe Woll in German, uh, was written to the Archduke Rudolf in 1809. And it's very strange that Beethoven had waited so long before the next sonata. Um, with Opus 81a, the Les Adieu, he had closed a chapter in his life, and I think he, he felt that you know, there was nothing new to be said in the form of the piano sonata. It was also a very difficult period in Beethoven's life. I mean, his deafness has deteriorated very badly. There had been serious financial problems. Um, there have been family problems with the death of his brother. And uh, he had to take care of his nephew, Karl. And all of that, plus also getting ready for the revisions of his opera Fidelio, have kept him very busy, and there, there was really no time to think about piano sonatas. But I think he, he has gathered his strengths and his ideas together um, in these four or five years, and he comes with this E minor sonata, he dedicates it to Moritz von Lichnowsky, the brother of Karl von Lichnowsky, an aristocratic Viennese family who have been great patrons of Beethoven's. Uh, there is an anecdote here. He must have said to Schindler or to Ferdinand Ries, one of his pupils, the first movement is meant to be a battle between the head and the heart. And the second movement is conversation with the beloved. Whether it's true, we don't know, but it's a very nice uh, description <laughs> of this music. However, this is already a period of Beethoven's life when he is no longer satisfied with Italian words words like Allegro, Adagio, Andante, he feels as a German patriot, but also as a, as a really deep-thinking musician, that these Italian words are not sufficient to, to give exact meaning to his thoughts. So he writes at the head of this first movement of the E minor sonata, uh, Mit Lebhaftigkeit, Durchaus mit Empfindung und Ausdruck. That means uh, with liveliness and all the way through with feeling and expression. We would think today, of course, how can you play music without expression? But even then Beethoven was thinking that I can no longer play the piano because I am deaf. So I have to give really as exact information to the other performers as possible. And from, from here on, we, we find 
that Beethoven's sonatas are full of expression marks and instructions about dynamics, about phrasing, and uh, although the manuscripts that we do possess of two of these works, Opus 90 and, and 101, sometimes they are very, very difficult to read, very difficult to decipher. I don't really know how on earth his contemporaries could, could read his handwriting. So, let's start again. This is in 3-4 time. 1-2-3, 1-2-3. Starts with an upbeat on the third beat. 1-2-3, 1-2-3. These are the first eight bars. And if you think about this description, the battle between the head and the heart, so between intellect and emotion, I would think that the first gesture is intellect. And this ends with a question mark and comes an answer Also, the first one was forte and, and quite strong, and the second is almost pleading. So question and answer, head and heart. Uh, motivically speaking, so if you think of the interval of a third, so we will speak about thirds a lot more when we come to the Hammer Klavier Sonata, but it's already pointing the way towards it. So, so. Again, you see, the answer comes like from a string quartet. It could have been written for a string quartet, but the beginning of the piece is symphonic. So, orchestra, string quartet. minor on the dominant. Now comes the next eight bars, something completely different. And again, it closes on the dominant and then there is a fermata where you switch off your metronomes. Uh, not that it was ever on. And so this second phrase, why is it different? Because I feel that the first eight bars were almost vertical in, in their energy. And now comes something very melodic, very horizontal. Opposed to Haydn and Mozart, Beethoven is the first legato composer. In Haydn and Mozart, you have these slurs which are never really longer than a bar. Mozart's slurs are always as long as a violinist can play on one bow. Beethoven's are very long sometimes, eight bars or, or ten or fifteen bars long, and that has got nothing to do with how much you can play on, on a bow, but it's, it's his imagination. And it's sometimes totally unreal and unplayable on an instrument. But it, it has to be there in the imagination. So I play again phrase number two and go into the next one. end on the tonic and then there is another fermata. 
And so these first 24 bars, 3 times 8, they constitute the, the backbone of this whole movement. Uh, the third phrase, I would still say the this huge leap, an octave plus a seventh. And again, Beethoven looks back 20 years to his sonata opus 2, number 2. Here you have the same leap. It's not a coincidence. It's um, like you, you look at your, your children's photos. <laughs> so, I play again the first 20, 24 bars. What happens here, suddenly we have these bare, very scary octaves. We have, so that means only the dominant and the tonic, without any harmonies. And you have a, a bare rhythm. One, two, three, one, two, three, one. And it's it's pianissimo. Then it's it's very scary, and the dynamics of Beethoven are extreme here in this sonata. We, you have between pianissimo and fortissimo all the all the shades and and colors in between, and then comes this first outbreak. <laughs> strokes of, I would say to a string player, play, play twice down bow. It's no, no, it's a denial. And that, another one. And this is incredible because we are in A minor. Again, pianissimo, and this, this B flat is a is a departure to very far away regions. But what happens now on the piano? B flat is enharmonic with A sharp. I don't want to go into the technicalities. Unfortunately, the piano is a half mechanical instrument and we cannot make the distinction in intonation like a violinist could do between B flat and A sharp. But we can do it in our imagination. If I think of B flat, I, then my brain and my heart is thinking differently than if I think of A sharp. When the E natural comes. This is a tritone, an uh, interval of the devil, as they said in certain religious circles. Now we have this diminished seventh chord, but it's already no longer B flat, the bass, but A sharp. We 
stage the B minor, which is the dominant of, of E minor. <laughs> And then he writes this, this accompaniment of, of agitato quavers. And together. is the fortissimo and there he writes ritardando again he's very specific with his in instructions he doesn't leave much for the choice of the performer so and listen to these two notes f sharp and g this this will be crucial in the whole movement and so this g comes 11 times <laughs> And now comes the next theme. So it was F sharp G. And now comes the inversion of that G and F sharp. Yeah. With again very excited semi quaver accompaniment which is very awkward to play and if you look at the bass line actually it sounds like like the but that's a coincidence um, uh, anyway maybe it's not a coincidence because I, we always find this connection between Schubert and Beethoven. Anyway, the f main theme and the inversion of that would be and so so the bass line is the inversion of the main theme. And this, this is the way Beethoven composes. He takes small cells and motives and they go through in all stages of not just the movement but all the movements and this is why what makes Beethoven quite unique although again this comes from the school of Haydn Haydn is the great master so let's go on <laughs> And the final theme, a crashing dissonance We're between again F sharp and G. What we hear. Napolitan six. Uh, but this is quite daring. It's it's very modern this music. Again the G F sharp. probably notice it, it's very compact it's one of the shortest expositions in Beethoven it's over in less than a minute but it's it feels very short but a, a lot is happening so he finishes the exposition with this B minor chords and the development starts with a single B natural Now, this quaver accompaniment 
we, ha we heard that in the so now it goes into the alto voice can hear that this is a new language, this is no longer the language of, of the appassionata and the les adieux. this beautiful theme we heard that in bar 9 so now we only hear the first four bars and Beethoven writes a wonderful counterpoint to it which is quite independent and I would like to point out already here that like all great composers, they realize at a certain point in their lives that Bach is the father figure of music. It sounds obvious, but it's not so obvious. And the moment uh, they discover this, then there is a, there is a new um, sphere in their in the way they, they write. This, this happened to Mozart uh, around 1782 when in the library of Baron van Swieten he, he discovered the works of Bach and then his music becomes so much more complex and full of counterpoint and, and his, they are all his writing fugues and the same happens with, with Beethoven. This is pure is such a beautiful counterpoint. Now the, the melody goes to the tenor. But then he writes a wonderful ornamental decoration above the other. and now it goes to the bass. So again, we have this process of deconstruction. We had an eight-bar theme, and first he gives us four bars of it, and then two bars, and then just one bar, and he even breaks that further down. Um, let me play for you this whole section. could follow this as uh, the smaller and smaller units <laughs> two bars and one 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 and then <laughs> and the, the bass line progresses higher <laughs> and the arrive on the tonic 6-4 chords and this whole accompaniment or ornamental 
which seems like secondary, but what happened? Uh, then he stops on this. These are these five notes, semi quavers, then augmentation, then it becomes quavers and then crotchets and then minims. Uh. The lower voice imitates the upper one. This is, I spent some time with this section because this is very unusual. Uh. Now, from five notes there were, then, then they were four, and when it comes down to three notes, then Beethoven realizes that G, F sharp, E, and we are back to the... But it's very difficult to, to grasp. Let me play it again. Concentrated, compact section of, of imitation. And then we are back to the beginning. So, this is quite extraordinary. Beethoven had not composed like that before. The recapitulation has some new features, but I would not like to we'll spend so much time on that because then we never come to the end of this program. Uh, and just let me play the coda. Fermata. And we come to... which is the same as the third phrase, with the difference that there is no retard, no ritardando. It, it ends in, it evaporates. supposed to be the conversation with the beloved and nicht zu geschwind und sehr singbar vorzutragen not too fast and to be played in a very singing manner those people who claim that Beethoven was not a great melodist should be proven wrong here uh, you could almost think of of a Schubert sonata here, and indeed there is an E minor unfinished sonata by the young Schubert, who was 19 years old, which... Uh, well, it is purely the Beethoven sonata, but unfortunately the Beethoven came first. However, this is not to, not to say anything bad about our beloved Schubert, because he, this is his homage to Beethoven. Um, 
So you, you have these wonderful horizontal melodic lines. However, let's not forget the head and the intellect. One, because the third and in, in major, the inversion of... This rondo theme comes back about five times during the movement, and as great a musician as Arthur Rubinstein, who had to play this sonata at some silly competition in Russia, all competitions are silly. <laughs> <laughs> But today there are much more of them than there used to be. So. The more there are, the sillier they get. <laughs> And Rubinstein complained that, uh, you know, this, move, this second movement of the E minor Saturday, why does Beethoven bring back the theme so many times? Uh, it's, it's, it's really, it occurs too often. And I couldn't disagree more with him because if, if somebody writes a, a theme this beautiful, You cannot hear it often enough. And it always, it is never, never really the same because the way you play a rondo theme, it depends on what happened before and what is coming after. So after a, a stormy episode, if this rondo theme returns, then, then you hear it with, with different ears. So this is a, a rondo movement with certain elements of the sonata form. Um, here is one of the episodes. And we come to the second theme. Uh, structure of, of, of the, the concept of the sounds there. It's like a measured, written out, slow trill in contrary motion, but together they give you a, a sound that, that's like natural painting. Uh, again, like we so often hear with Schubert's music, uh, You hear the water, like in, in Schöne Müller, in... And here also... little transitional passage, we come to the next theme, which is like a, a chorale with triplet accompaniment. And the next four bars are a variation with semiquaver accompaniment. something that sounds so natural and so obvious, but again, listen to the bass line. Again. It's again this, this motif of the third, inverted. Um, I don't think it's a second too long. 
And Beethoven is never too long. It's uh, just some people have a short patience. <laughs> yes. Uh, then comes another very interesting episode. It's almost like a development. Starts with this choral theme. <laughs> stormy episode, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful homecoming, and one needs these, these contrasts. Um, just a little about the coda, the end of this movement, which is very beautiful. Mm. The theme goes from the soprano to the tenor voice. the soprano again. Back to the tenor. It's a, such a wonderful sound. It's like, like a cello playing. Mm -hmm. It's not like a piano at all. to the soprano. finished here, but comes still an epilogue. And it ends, nobody really notices that it ended. It's a wonderful, he slows down quite under the normal tempo. And this is again like a string quartet. All the voices. And then he starts to write accelerando, and then you reach tempo primo. You, you reach with, this, with accelerando the normal speed not beyond that. This is again something that a lot of performers argue about this. How far should this accelerando go? I'm quite convinced that it should not go beyond the first tempo. And then you reach the first tempo, and it says piano, and the last bar is subito pianissimo, and no slowing down. So this is how it goes. Even this last four, it's 
like an inversion. So beginning and end meet at the, at the end. There should be really, ideally, no applause after this sonata, because there is nothing to applaud. <laughs> and this sonata is, is not, a, not a concert piece. It, it was not meant to be a concert piece, not for effect, not to make an impression. But it's a tour de force of, of concentrated efforts and of composition. So, and if I go into the next sonata, it sounds like the continuation of the previous one. 